it's an incredible pleasure and honor to close the September edition of Living Histories with the one and only Tom Whitten. I'm such a fan. Tom, please tell us about Living Histories. Thank you so much, Sri. And thanks for inviting me it's, um, to be among such company. It's, it is an honor, as, I, as the other speakers have said. So it, I read the website and it said, well, this is about um, careers in biophysics. And I don't quite qualify, really. Um, I'm not a biophysicist, but I do hope to that I do things that uh, get um, involved principles that uh, living matter cares about. I study self-organizing phenomena like um, driven many body systems like frustrated growth or controllable solidity and rigidity, things like that. Um, I love it, love nothing better to, than to have this have a big impact in biology, but I don't have such high hopes. But this, what I can tell you about, biophysicists or not, is how I got where I am. It, it is not a likely story, as I hope to explain to you. Um, so here I am, an established professor at a really good university. It's an enviable position. And so how did such a thing happen? Can I explain it? Well, I'll try. So um, starting out from every, like everybody else in the session did of, of, of what kind of background I came from. I was born um, to a budding academic physician and a bright medical student right in the middle of World War II. So um, my dad wasn't around, he was in Europe and I was uh, being raised by, I was a baby being raised by my mom and her sisters. And they doted on me so much. And every move I made, it was a stroke of genius for them. You, you, you know how people are with babies. But they had this effect on me that I got to believe that I was pretty special. And, um, and at, as I grew up and was a child, it, was, it kind of showed, I was a little bit like, that Sheldon character in the uh, Big Bang Theory. You remember, I was cocky and I was really you know, interested in getting approval and getting good grades and stuff and being clever. And, um, and I wasn't very interested in the kids around me and nor they in me. I wasn't very extroverted. I wasn't athletic. I wasn't good looking. And, and I was the most working for the teacher's approval in the relationship with them. That's what I was like. And um, so then I got to college and it was full of nerds like me. It was, it was uh, such a great experience to have um, uh, fellow students I could relate to as so much. It was called Reed College. And I felt um, a big kinship with the other students and it was, it was, it made me a little bit more human, I think. These, um, they were wonderful to know and work with. And, and, but I also got to see that I was nothing special at Reed College. I was just in the middle of the pack. So I, then I got into a good graduate school, mostly from uh, standardized test scores. It was UC San Diego. And um, I was, again, nothing special. I was in the you know, right more or less in the middle of the pack. And um, not an obvious pick to end up as a professor. I hadn't even been noticed by anybody of that stature. But um, a happenstance that happened to me was that my advisor went to take a leave of absence at Princeton. And I got put in with the Princeton Graduate School and then I got noticed by some some people like John Hopfield, who was really an inspiration throughout my life. And um, he later offered me a postdoc. Woo woo. In those days, um, it was a different thing to get a postdoc and a different um, kind of expectation. It was an expectation on the advisor to take that money and and be a steward of it and develop uh, find a good person and to help them develop 
And that's what they, um, Hopfield tried to do with me. He didn't give me you know, deadlines and problems. He, um, and I had a second postdoc that was the same way. And I, I was lucky and I had every chance to, to be productive. But after four years of postdocs, I had very little to show for them as far as publications, academics and stuff. Um, but I, nevertheless, I got one great offer from the University of Michigan. And it's because I love talking to the experimenters there and I got a strong recommendation and I had a couple of arcane papers, it's not a, a, a slam dunk case to get a job and you, I wouldn't have gotten it in this time, um, uh, the current times. So after several years at Michigan, I had little to show for it. I seemed to be kind of a late bloomer who never did bloom. I was really spinning my wheels as a theorist because I thought what a theorist did was find more and more arcane subtleties in the thing I worked on, which was the theory of phase transitions. I had no confidence one way or another, and I wasn't teaching very well either. So this didn't work out well for me. I got fired, um, and justly so. And um, I, objectively, it was a grim future, but somehow I was optimistic because I was beginning to see a new way forward. Um, and one of the main things that happened to make that possible was that I met my wife, Molly. I owe her so much. It, because it, from a non-confident nerd, she made me think I had something going for me and it kind of gave me faith in myself to start working on things. And um, one person said that Tom just got a personality transplant. So then the next thing was a, a, an idea, an idea called fractals. These are geometric structures that help you really see what's going on in a phase transition very concretely. Um, Jason will appreciate this, I think. And um, anyway, just from simple geometric rules. And so I began to see how to think about phase transition in a kind of orthogonal way from what was mostly done in field theory. And, um, and I really was keen to tell people about it. And, but by the, and this took hold. By the time I left Michigan, this work had really blossomed and it was a discovery of having to do with stochastic fractal growth. And um, this was, had it really a new take on the idea of what was going on in a phase transition. So th this really put me on the map and um, it, um, it, it saved me when I needed to get a job because I got a great job at Exxon. And from there I got, a, a, it was a great place to grow as a scientist. I had several great mentors, and I tell you a few of them. One of them was an intellectual mentor and inspiration, Pierre Gilles de Gennes, who gave you the, the permission and the freedom to not be arcane, to, to say something in a simple way and have it really count as a discovery. Um, and other people that really were great mentors were Phil Pincus, and Sid Nagel at both um, Exxon and my current job at U Chicago. So I also needed a much needed jolt of humility, a hum sorry, humility from this distinguished theorist, uh, Moral Cohen. Okay, so I told you this story about how I had a kind of a not obvious trajectory to where I find myself now. And it was mostly from the things that made the difference were events outside myself. They weren't my virtue, really. And um, it, that's, that's the main th the take home message. Um, but I do think that I was able to make some fortunate choices. And this is my list of take home messages. So I recognize that whatever insights I had they should be thought of as a gift given to me from my environment and from, you know, just stuff that I didn't control. 
and um and i should celebrate them but i shouldn't dream of taking credit for them and then i on the question of competitiveness oh, life is competitive but it doesn't have to be and i learned that that was not my way i would want to complement others work and not try to compete with others to, to do what they did better than they did um and then it in a what I also learned in working with people in a career is a win to give up credit for the sake of mutual progress. Never mind about the credit. That's how I try to play the game. And it's a win also to invest effort to understand and celebrate the work of colleagues. It is a great way to grow the science and grow the science and also grow the scientists. So that's where I got where I am. That's my story. I hope you see, as Jason emphasized, and and also you did, um, Evelyn. Um, it really takes all kinds to make science work, and I'm telling you about how it worked for me. And I know it's really interdependent on other people doing science, as I could never have done it. Happily, we have plenty of different personalities and and plenty of diversity now and that diversity is getting uh, even you know deli deliberately greater these days and it's a good thing so um thanks for letting me tell you my story um thank you so much tom on behalf of the audience i'm clapping um we have time for a few questions audience please feel free to send me your questions via chat um i'm going to start by asking one on behalf of the audience which is you made this point, which has come up in a few different living history talks by theorists, especially about feeling the pressure to be obscure because what's profound must be obscure. And you had to arrive at discovering uh, simplicity <laughs> almost as like a process instead of naturally being drawn to something simple as a theorist. Would you comment on this um, sort of journey from searching for abstruse uh, truths and ideas to finding more simple ways of saying things, especially for people who are working with complex systems such as biological systems? Yeah, you might ask, if I can rephrase, you might ask, if it's so clear in retrospect that you should be simple, where in the world did we get the thought that we had to be, uh, you know, arcane and subtle? Where did we get that from? And I, um, I, I got it from legitimate places. I got it from people like Einstein or Heisenberg, you know, who you just had to, to, struggle to understand it and then when you did boom it was so wonderful and i wanted to do something like that and so it had to be as hard as it was for me to learn it it had to be that hard at least to discover it and um i don't know how how they discovered it but i they tried to get underneath the theory underneath the formalism and then um get their insight and come to the formalism later. That's how I think. But the biology is complicated, but I think the way forward with it is still to find the simple things. And that's what, um, I think that's what Jason and, and uh, Evelyn would agree with me. You, you may have be faced with a hopelessly complicated phenomenon, but you're, the, the way forward is to find something simple about it, something simple in general. Um, thank you. Music to our ears. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is an audience question I'm going to take now about, um, they are curious how you made yourself optimistic and how you shaped your environment to be good and positive around you in your career. So I, I was, let's see how, so I got the news that I was fired. My wife tells me that I was sort of 
bouncy after that. It was sort of a, a phony optimism. Um, but I had something going for me at that point where I got fired that because this this stuff of stochastic growth that I talked about was already a going concern. It was too late to save me for my job. And I had this horrible track record to to um, dictate that I shouldn't be kept. Um, but I had abundance of hope and it was abundance of kind of support in that hope. Also, I have to say, I forgot to put this in or I didn't, that I said, this is a rough time for anybody. I'm going to need help. And I asked Molly and she said, yeah, you are going to need help. And so I, you know, I was um, seeing a, um, not exactly a psychologist, but a um, clinical social worker who was just kind of walking through the thing and, and uh, walking through, you know, how tough it must be and how, like that. And that was that was just for a few months, but it but it helped. Is that what you were bargained for? Uh, yes, and thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you overall, Tom. Uh, I'm thanking you again on behalf of the audience and closing the 